The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the traditional Catholic faith and religion as professed and practiced by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of the Second Vatican Council and the so-called New Order of Mass. Hello, welcome back to What Catholics Believe. This is a, one of our programs on modernism. This is a continuation, in fact, part four of our treatment of modernism. And we're looking at the encyclical of Pope St. Pius X, entitled Pascenti Dominici Gregis, in which St. Pius X condemns the errors of the modernists. As you recall, at the beginning of that encyclical, St. Pius X calls modernism uh, the great enemy of the church, modernists the greatest enemies the church has ever known. And he says they are the greatest and the most dangerous threat to the church because they are within the church, even in the clergy, and they also attack not just a doctrine here or there, they attack the very source of all doctrine. They want to redefine the very meaning of the word faith. They attack, as he says, by laying the axe to the very root of faith. <clears throat> so St. Pius X goes on to mention that the modernist has multiple personalities. Uh, he's a philosopher, a theologian, a believer, and so on. And uh, we're looking at some of those personalities right now as outlined by St. Pius X in his encyclical. And uh, we talked about the modernist as St. Pius X started uh, discussing the modernist mindset as uh, rooted in a philosophy, a false philosophy. Uh, phenomenalism, which denies the fact that the human mind can reach truth, even about the world around us. That uh, in the world around us, our minds can only know the appearances of things, uh, the mere phenomena as things appear to us. And uh, therefore, the next step where we learn from creatures about the Creator is impossible for the modernist to know about God from the things that God created is not possible. But the modernist then has to explain, well, how is there then such a thing as faith and, and religion and church and so on? <clears throat> and he says that uh, these things actually all come from a religious sentiment within us. It's not about mind. It's not a matter of our intelligence, our God-given intelligence, accepting the truth that God reveals to us about Himself. Truth that God reveals and we accept it on the authority of God revealing it to us. This is the concept of faith that we have as Catholics. The modernist says that's impossible. The modernist says this is not a function of the intellect. It's rather a matter of the religious sentiment. It's kind of a feeling in man that he needs the divine, he has a, a groping need for the divine, that he runs into the limitations of his knowledge, <clears throat> uh, both knowledge within himself, his self-knowledge, and knowledge of the things around him. And beyond that, he sees only darkness, and he, he's groping to know what lies beyond that. And this is a, a need for the divine, something beyond. And uh, what furnishes that is an experience of his religious sentiment. Uh, far from something of the intellect assenting to truth, it is an experience that happens within a person, <clears throat> which he then tries to express, and he expresses it in short statements, which are initial statements of faith. Then he elaborates those into dogmas, he needs then to share his experience, um, to uh, spread his experience to others. Therefore, he gathers in society, which we call a church, to do just that. <clears throat> and so on. All the things that a modernist believes begin, start with the idea of uh, faith being a matter of religious experience for the individual. And we talked about how the modernist therefore thinks that all religious experiences are valid and true. <clears throat> uh, some are more vital than others in that they actually thrive, grow, spread, others kind of die out. But um, for the modernist to uh, uh, say there's such a thing as one true religion revealed by God is an abomination 
The modernist would condemn that idea. The modernist is necessarily an ecumenist. He necessarily sees uh, the divine expressing itself in all the different religions, in all the different religious experiences. Uh, the modernist sees these experiences evolving in time. As we ourselves evolve, so our religious experience must involve, evolve also. So the modern expression, the modern expression of these experiences, therefore modernism, is the state of the divine and our experience of the divine at this moment. Ultimately, according to the modernist idea, there's going to be a continued evolution of the religious experience of mankind. And uh, this is going to bring about greater unity. It's going to have, they say, certain effects in the church. They call it reforming the church. They're going to reform the church according to the modern ideas. Now, that's where we ended the last video. We were talking about the modernist <clears throat> idea of the church and how it's exactly what St. Pius X condemned in his encyclical against modernism, against condemning the errors of modernism, that is. Exactly what Francis is expressing as the idea of the synodal church, S-Y-N-O-D-A-L, a church governed by synods. This is the new structure of the church that Francis is, is bringing about. <clears throat> Francis intends to canonize uh, Montini, uh, Paul VI, in a few days. And he attributes to Montini, Paul VI, the, the proposal to turn the Catholic Church into a church of synods, a synodal church, he gives Paul VI credit for this, for this idea. And uh, Paul, Francis now is going to put this into effect, and he's already begun. He has had his extraordinary synod of the family, followed by his ordinary synod of the family. Now he's got this synod of youth going on. And uh, in fact, it is, it is precisely what St. Pius X has condemned in his encyclical as the modernist concept of the church, which is not the Catholic Church at all. In fact, it's very peculiar. What Francis is doing at the Synod right now is uh, alarming many people. Um, it is, as I mentioned last time, a matter of letting the, the young people speak to the bishops and communicate to the bishops of the modern church their concepts of how the church should be run their concept of where the faith is now, their experience of living faith in the world today. According to Francis's synodal concept, the bishops are going to learn from these young people what the state of the faith is, what the state of the faith should be. The, the young people are kind of lecturing the bishops as to what this should be from the reality of their daily lives. The bishops are going to kind of distill this down, present it to Francis, who is then going to express the ideas in formulas, which are going to be dogmas. <clears throat> but Francis is very clear on the fact that dogmas need to change as the experience of the grassroots a Christian changes. So the, the faith experience changes, so does the faith change, so does the modern concept of God change, the modern concept of church must change. And Francis sees that his role as the Bishop of Rome is to express all of this in formulas which everyone in the church is going to accept. So that's why he says he's kind of the principle of unity, because he's the one who's going to express the common mind of the people. <clears throat> that's his role. That's what he considers the papacy to be. That's the very nature of the office of what he calls the Petrine ministry. It is not the Catholic papacy. The Catholic papacy is actually from Christ and is inspired by the Holy Ghost, not by the people. <clears throat> Peter doesn't take a survey of what the people think, what the people think the faith should be, and derive from that his marching orders as to then coming up with formulas to express what the man in the street is thinking about 
what the faith should be today. Um, this is, this is uh, what a politician does. <clears throat> and so uh, when we have the book The Political Pope, uh, we realize, yes, I think that's by George M uh, Neumeier, uh, the idea is that that's exactly what the modernist produces. A political pope who basically goes by surveys, as Francis does before these synods, <clears throat> gathers all of these survey answers from uh, canvassing hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, has people then kind of organizing the results and passing it on, up the ladder here, to him finally. Now, <clears throat> in order to uh, talk about this question, and by the way, Francis attributes all of that, as I say, to Paul VI, whom he's planning on canonizing in a few days. Uh, after his youth synod, he's going to canonize Paul VI, who is the originator of this idea that the church should be governed by synods, <clears throat> basically becoming a kind of democratic, democratic church. Now, it's important for us to understand how this is exactly what was condemned by St. Pius X as being not the Catholic Church, but kind of the anti-Catholic Church. And in order to convey this idea, I want to read to you and comment as I go from the encyclical Pascendi, numbers 23, 24, and 25. Here we, we find encapsulated St. Pius X's account of the modernist concept of the Church and why it is so wrong. Note, <clears throat> he wrote this published this in 1907. <clears throat> he saw Francis coming, actually, in the very principles of modernism. Here's what St. Pius X says. <clears throat> A wider field for comment is opened when you come to treat of the vagaries devised by the modernist school concerning the church. You must start with the supposition that the church has its birth in a double need, the need of the individual believer especially if he has had some original and special experience to communicate his faith to others. And the need of the mass, that is, the mass is when the faith has become common to many, to form itself into a society. So when he says the need of the mass, he doesn't mean the holy sacrifice, the mass. He means the masses of the people kind of aggregating into a society, again, to share in the religious experience. He says that they, they, they get together, the masses get together to share this when their experience, the, the religious experience has become common to many, to form itself into a society and to guard, increase, and propagate the common good. What then is the church, he asks. The modernist answers, it is the product of the collective conscience or collective consciousness, that is to say of the society of individual consciences, which by virtue of the principle of vital permanence all depend on one first believer, who for Catholics is Christ. Now every society needs a directing authority to guide its members towards the common end, to conserve prudently the elements of cohesion, which in a religious society are doctrine and worship. So as St. Pius X is explaining to us here, the church comes about as a society from a needs people have, okay? And, uh, but, but all of this is driven by the original religious experience of Jesus long ago. <clears throat> but to have a society, a church, you have to have something that holds it together. He says that comes down to doctrine and worship. He's also going to mention authority. That's where he's going, though. He's going to explain uh, what kind of what the modernist idea of doctrine is, what the modernist idea of worship is, and, and what kind of authority this is going to require. He says what comes out of this idea is, with regard to doctrine, with regard to worship, there has to be a kind of authority. He calls it a triple authority in the Catholic Church, disciplinary, dogmatic, liturgical. He says the nature of this authority is to be gathered from its origin and its rights and duties, from its nature. In other words, what is the nature of the concept of the modernist regarding authority in the church? 
He says, well, look at where they say the church comes from. It comes from this impulse. It comes from a need. And it basically is like a collective consciousness, a collective consciousness. That's where the authority has to come from, he says. He says, in past times, according to the modernist, it was a common error that authority came to the church from without, that is to say, directly from God. And it was then rightly held to be autocratic. But this conception has now grown obsolete, he says. This idea of the church receiving authority from God directly is obsolete. We must leave that idea behind. Why? Because it doesn't coincide with the modern idea of authority. He says in the same way as the church is a vital emanation of the collectivity of consciousness or consciences, so too authority emanates vitally from the church itself. So you have the church which is like a collectivity, like the common consciousness of the people who make it up. So authority also has to come from there, from that common consciousness of the people. So he says, because that's where the authority comes from, the authority has to be subjected to. It has to be subjective to and submissive to the common consciousness of the people. If authority in the church should disown this dependence that is upon the common consciousness of the believers, then the authority can become a tyranny. We are living in an age, I'm quoting St. Pius again, according to the modernists, we're living in an age when the sense of liberty has reached its fullest development and when the public consciousness or conscience has in the civil order introduced popular government. Now there are not two consciences in man any more than there are two lives. It is for the ecclesiastical authority, therefore, to shape itself according to demo democratic forms. Just as in civil society now, we have evolved to the point where mankind goes along with democratic forms of authority, where it is the people who dictate, so it must be in the church too. The church also has to go along and to accept democratic form. Unless it wishes to provoke and foment an intestine conflict, intestine conflict in the consciences of mankind. In other words, you can't have an autocratic church with authority from God in a society, a civil society, which believes in democracy with authority coming from the people. You have to have the whole, both, basically, the church and the state adopting a democratic form of government. The penalty for refusal to accept a democratic authority in the, in the church is disaster, he says. For it is madness to think that the sentiment of liberty as it is now spread abroad, can surrender. <clears throat> Were it forcibly confined and held in bonds, <clears throat> terrible would be its outburst, sweeping away at once both church and religion. Such is the situation for the modernists, and their one great anxiety is in consequence to find a way of conciliation between the authority of the church and the liberty of believers. So the modernist sees himself as a reformer, having to find a way to work it out in the church, that there's authority in the church, but also the autonomy and the liberty of the individual believer. How do you reconcile those two things? This is where the modernist thinks his great genius has come into play here. Now, St. Pius X and number 24 in the encyclical goes on to explain that the modernist concludes the church must be separated from the state, the state, civil government, must be separated from the church so that they, they're totally, totally distinct. <clears throat> you can't have a state government that recognizes a true religion, <clears throat> a true church, he says. That's the modernist absolutely in principle denies that being possible. But he even goes farther and says the modernist says that insofar as any church 
would express its faith and would practice its faith, it's entering into the realm of this world, what is visible, what is audible. In other words, he says it's representing itself in together with the phenomena of the world. And he says, insofar as the <clears throat> faith experiences of the people are represented in, in dogma and worship and so on, then the practice of the religion enters into the realm of the phenomena. And who is it who has the right to govern and rule those matters? The state, the civil government, the powers of this world properly have the right to govern and control expression of religion. This is what he says here. This is where the modernist is going. This is where <clears throat> the, the practice of any faith is actually, according to the modernist mind, in the control of the state, of the, of the meaning the, the civil society. Now, if you go back to the last document of Vatican II, uh, the Nitatis Humanae Personae and the dignity of the human person. It talks about the liberty to practice religion and over and over again in that document it says it only allows for this, the control of the civil government. The civil authority has to control the practice of religion in, in order that it be somehow uh, kept from being antisocial, uh, that it be disturbing, uh, give, provide a disturbance to society. It never mentions the authority of the church to have any authority or government over that, only the civil government. And so this, whole, again, co coincide perfectly with what St. Pius X is condemning here as the modernist concept that only the civil government has the right to control the manifestations of religion and the way it is practiced for the sake of public order. If you read number 24 here in St. Pius X's encyclical, you'll see where, where he says, the state must therefore be separated from the church and the Catholic must practice, but not as a citizen. As a, as a believer he can practice, but as a citizen he has to leave his religion out of us. And therefore St. Pius X says that in practice the church must be subject to the state which has actually the last word to say about how the religion is going to be practiced in society because the state is responsible for order in society. Now in number 25, St. Pius X goes into the question of the magisterium. The magisterium is the teaching authority of the church. What does the modernist make of the magisterium of the church? We talked about what the modernist thinks about authority in the church that it actually comes from the grassroots up. Here's what St. Pius X has to say. It is not enough for the modernist school that the state should be separated from the church. For as faith is subordinated to science as far as its phenomenal elements, that is, as it manifests itself in this world, must be subject also to science, so too, in temporal matters, the church must be subject to the state. That is, the church in temporal matters must be subject to the civil government. He said they do not say this openly as yet, but they will say it when they wish to be logical. For given the principle that in temporal matters the state possesses absolute mastery, it will follow that when the believer, not fully satisfied with his merely internal acts of religion, proceeds to external acts of religion, such for instance as the administration or reception of sacraments, these will fall under the control of the state because they actually involve phenomena. They involve words and actions in this world. What will then become of ecclesiastical authority which can only be exercised by external acts, and all external acts are subject to civil authority, civil government. Obviously, it will be completely under the dominion of the state. It is this inevitable consequence which impels many among liberal Protestants to reject all external worship, nay, all external religious community, and makes them advocate what they call individual personal religion, 
If the modernists have not yet reached this point, they, they do ask the church in the meanwhile to be good enough to follow spontaneously where they lead her and adapt herself to the civil forms in vogue of the society where they live. You see, and this is what's bringing us to the next level of the modernist idea today. Such are their ideas about disciplinary authority. But far more advanced and far more pernicious are their teachings on doctrinal and dogmatic authority. This is their conception of the magisterium of the church. No religious society, they say, can be a real unit unless the religious conscience I use the word consciousness, of its members be one, and one also the formula which they adopt, that's which they adopt to express their common religious consciousness. <clears throat> but the double unity requires a kind of common mind whose office is to find and determine the formula that corresponds best with the common conscience. <clears throat> and it must have, moreover, an authority sufficient to enable it to impose on the community the formula which it has decided. From the combination, and as it were, fusion of these two elements, the common mind which draws up the formula, and the authority which imposes it, arises, according to the modernists, the notion of the ecclesiastical magisterium. And as this magisterium springs, in its last analysis, from the individual consciences and possesses its mandate of public utility for the benefit of the members, <clears throat> it follows that the ecclesiastical magisterium, that's the teaching authority of the modernist church, must be subordinated to the consciousnesses of the people, to the consciences of the people and should therefore take democratic forms. To prevent individual consciences from revealing freely and openly the impulses they feel, <clears throat> therefore to hinder criticism from impelling dogmas towards their necessary evolution, this is not a legitimate use but an abuse of power. Given for the public utility, he says, People have to be free to express whatever their religious experience is. Authority in the church can't repress them. That would be an abuse of its power. So too, he says, a due method and a measure must be observed in the exercise of authority to condemn and prescribe a work without the knowledge of the author, without hearing his explanations, without discussion, assuredly savors of tyranny. And thus, here again, a way must be found to save the full rights of authority on the one hand and the liberty of the individual church members on the other. In the meantime, the proper course for the Catholic will be to proclaim publicly his profound respect for authority and then continue to do as he pleases, to follow his own personal bent. Interestingly enough, he says, their general directions for the church may be put in this way. Since the end of the church is entirely spiritual, the religious authority must strip itself of all external pomp which adorns it in the eyes of the public. So, it says that Actually, the utility of authority in the church is purely for their spiritual welfare. And therefore, the church must be a poor church, stripped of all external pomp and circumstance, all triumphalism. Uh, it must, uh, you know, do away with these great, beautiful ceremonies and so on, and just be very, very simple and very, very poor. Exactly Francis's concept. This is what he's been pushing from the very beginning. Exactly what the modernists are saying here. And he goes on, St. Pius X goes on in the number 26 to say, to finish with this whole question of faith, it remains to be seen what the modernists have to say about their development. First of all, they lay down the general principle that in a living religion, everything is subject to change. Here we have exactly the, the voice of Francis. 
that in a living religion, everything is subject to change. Francis is on record as saying, tradition and change are the same in the church. Change is the tradition of the church. That's the one constant thing in the church is changed, he says, is changing. He says that a, in a living religion, everything is subject to change and must change. And in this way, they pass to what may be said to be among their chief of their doctrines, and that is evolution. To the laws of evolution, everything is subject. Dogma must evolve. The church must evolve. Worship must evolve. The sacred books must evolve, must evolve. The faith must evolve. The modernist says the penalty for failure to change is death. They will die away because if they do not change, they no longer express the current faith experience of the people. Now, having laid down this law of evolution, the modernists themselves teach us how it works. And here we see very clearly Francis's idea of a synodal church that he, he inherited from Paul VI. First, he said, with regard to faith, the primitive form of faith, they tell us, was the, the rudimentary and common expression of faith to, to all men alike. It had its origin in human nature and human life. Vital evolution brought with it progress. By an increasing penetration of the religious sentiment in the consciousness. And this progress is of two kinds. It was negative by eliminating all the foreign extraneous elements. And it was positive by intellectual and moral refining of man, by means of which the ideas enlarged and enlightened while the religious sentiment became more elevated and more intense. So for there to be the progress of faith, he says, there are no other causes necessary than the evolution of the religious genius of mankind, notably in the prophets, of whom they say Christ was the greatest of the prophets because his religious experience was so intense. He says, it fell to the lot of the followers of Christ to have new and original experiences, fully in harmony with the needs of their times. The progress of dogma is due chiefly to the obstacles which faith meets and has to overcome, contradictions it has to repel, a perpetual striving to penetrate into the mysteries. This happened in the case of Christ himself. In him that divine something which faith admitted in him expanded in such a way that he was at last held to be God. And the chief stimulus of evolution in the domain of worship, now this is going from faith to worship, the chief stimulant for evolution in the domain of worship consists, now get this, pure modernism, we're seeing it happen before our very eyes. The chief stimulus of evolution in the domain of worship consists in the need of adapting itself to the uses and customs of peoples. So we see the process of enculturation, uh, a principle central to the modernism of our times, bring in the cultural elements of the different peoples. St. Pius X was expressing this very idea in 1907 in condemning the modernist idea of worship, that it was actually drawing upon, through the process of evolution, the different cultures, even pagan cultures, of the world in which we live. Accommodating, accommodating itself, the church accommodating her worship to the historical conditions of the peoples harmonizing its worship with the existing forms of society, whatever the society may be, even pagan society. This is religious evolution in detail, he says. It all goes back to the theory of necessities and needs, the root of the entire system of the modernists, that faith, 
religion, dogma, church, worship, all accommodate themselves to the times in which we live. This is the historical reality of the modernist with regard to who God is, even. So in any case, we, we see what is happening here. <clears throat> is uh, as St. Pius X goes on to explain, is that we see in the modernist idea of the church a kind of uh, need to compromise and harmonize. The idea of authority and the idea of liberty. That the faith actually must derive from the religious experience coming from the religious sentiment of the people, it's me the members of the church, who then express that to their pastors, who then pass that on to the ultimate pastor, the Bishop of Rome, in this case, Francis, the modernist pope, who then expresses all of this into a matter of formulas which they must all accept to be in union with each other, to have a unity of faith. Francis, therefore, is the interpreter of the faith experience of the church. The modernist idea, the supreme pontiff of the modernist church, is the ultimate ex interpreter of the faith experience of all the people. <clears throat> he interprets it, he expresses it, infallibly so that all must accept his interpretation. No wonder he becomes like the Christ figure, who is now the, the, the central point from which the common belief must come. That all of the experiences of the people must coalesce in him and be expressed by him so that his expression must now go down and all the people must subscribe to it. That's the modernist idea. This is the ideal of the synodal church of Francis. And the new to be modernist, the saint, saint of their modernist uh, heaven, and that is Paul VI. So St. Pius X says they see the the liberty of the people is being the progressive force of faith. And authority in the church, magisterium, is being the uh, conservative or pre preservative force. But the preservative force is not meant to squelch the progressive force. It is meant to interpret it authentically and authoritatively. That's how Francis sees his role exactly what St. Pius X condemned here in his encyclical uh, against the errors of the modernists. You read this in number 27 of the encyclical. He says, this necessary requires some kind of a conflict and a battle, but the modernist sees himself as the great martyr of this great effort to reform the church. And if he's not appreciated, not understood, well, if the authority finds him uh, out of bounds, that's the price the modernist has to pay for the sake of making progress of dogma and pushing things forward in evolution. So the modernist finds himself as the one who understands the religious experience of the people, and he is the one who makes evolution possible by bringing that to the attention of uh, what they call the, the Holy Father, uh, the modernist pope, which has very little to do in common with the, the Catholic understanding of the papacy, of course. And so in number 28, St. Pius X goes on and says, and thus for the modernist, there is nothing stable, nothing immutable in the church. Everything is subject to change. So anyway, uh, when we talk about this concept of, of, the, of the church as condemned by St. Pius X, 
this concept of the modernists, of what the church must be in our day. <clears throat> and the modernist as his role of, of making the church change into this. Um, we see that Francis himself is the flag carrier. He is the leader of this whole idea, this whole transformation of the church, <clears throat> now into this synodal church, which hears the people and expresses their faith experience of the time. I mentioned to you last time that uh, what they call Pope Begolio, Francis says we need a new road for the papacy. I didn't mention to you what Francis wrote in praising Paul the, Paul the Sixth, and I think it was even at his some beatification of Paul the Sixth. Here's what Francis said. Now this goes back to uh, a homily that Francis gave about Paul the Sixth. He says, God is not afraid of new things. That is why he is continually surprising us, opening our hearts and guiding us in unexpected ways. He renews us. He constantly makes us new. A Christian who lives the gospel is God's newness in the church and in the world. How much God loves this newness. Francis always expresses this idea. God is the God of surprises. Always something new. God is always pulling something new out of the hand. Constant change, again, is the theme of Francis here. That's the theme of the modernists. Pat Francis goes on, On this day of the beatification of Pope Paul VI, he says, I think of the words with which he, Paul VI, established the Synod of Bishops. By carefully surveying the signs of the times, we are making every effort to adapt ways and methods to the growing needs of our time and the changing conditions of society. Now this is taken from Paul VI's apostolic letter, uh, a motu proprio entitled Apostolica Solicitudo, uh, the apostolic solicitude, okay? These are the words of Paul VI. Notice the modernism from beginning to end here. Surveying the signs of the times, okay? We're looking at the contemporary sense of mankind, making every effort to adapt ourselves, our ways, our methods, the ways and methods of the church to the growing needs. Again, we're talking about needs. Everything is based on needs in modernism. The growing needs of our time, the changing conditions of our society. Again, okay? We're keeping up with the Joneses here, but it's the Joneses and the Mohammeds and the Steinbergs and all the rest. We're keeping up with all of this, the changing conditions of society. This is what the Synod is, is created to do. You know, what came out of Vatican II were these bishops' conferences, and now changing further into bishops' synods, which exist to meet the people and to hear the people express the faith to them. This is where they're going. This is what Francis is saying here. When we're talking about this as it's going on before our very eyes right now in this synod in, in Rome right now, with Francis quasi-pontificating means meaning for him listening, 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 listening to what these people are saying, listening to what the people, now listening to what the young people are saying about their faith so the church can learn the faith from them. Okay? I want you to notice something, that Francis is carrying what is called a stang. Uh, this in place of the bishop's staff. He's not carrying a crozier. He's not carrying a pastoral staff. He's not carrying something surmounted by a crucifix. Uh, not even that distorted, twisted, uh, quasi-crucifix that Paul VI and his, his followers have introduced. Not even that. Francis is carrying a witch's staff. He's carrying a witch's stang, S-T-A-N-G. You can see it in the photographs coming from the Synod for the youth. And this witch's stang was presented to him by two young women. Well, not so young, 
Uh, one of them, at least, was 30 years old. Why she's at this youth conference, I don't know. But she was presenting to him, and there were photographs of her presenting this stain to Francis, who has a look of ecstasy on his face. And it's very, very clear in the photographs that she is wearing a witch's bracelet, bracelet, the red knotted cord around her wrist, which you see on the wrists of the followers of the Cabal, of the Kabbalah. There are pictures of Madonna wearing the knotted red cord, token, betokening her following of the Cabal. And she, with that very same hand, which uh, is adorning this red, knotted red cord of the Cabal, a satanic symbol, is presenting Francis with this stang, the satanic staff, which symbolizes the authority of Satan. Look into it yourselves. You'll see exactly what I'm saying. This is, be this is notorious now. Uh, I'd be surprised if any of you have not yet heard this, because it is so widely known now that this is taking place because of the scandal that has arisen from it. And when these young women, more or less young women, presented this to Francis back in, I think, April of this year at a gathering in the Circus Maximus, they said to him that they wished he would carry this at the Youth Synod, and that's exactly what he's doing. Um, it is scandalous that he's doing this. People ask, does he realize what it represents? Well, by now he certainly realizes it. He must know what it represents. But even if he didn't recognize it when it was presented to him, you'd think if he had a, a Catholic cell in his body, he would say, this is not a crozier, this is not a pastoral staff, this is not a crucifix, what is this thing? You'd think if he had a, com a bit of, com of common sense, he would check it out too. But he certainly realizes what it represents now, by now. He's been carrying it throughout the synod for youth. And they're applauding him. Even as he's listening to them dictate what the faith is, their faith experience is now. But you see, Francis is applauding Paul VI. And he's planning on canonizing Paul VI. And all one need do is look at the monumental portrait of Paul VI done over a 20-year period by a German Ernst Gunther Hansing, a Lutheran, not a Catholic gentleman, who has actually given room in the Vatican to paint this so-called portrait of Paul VI. And we should have that on the screen for you to actually see this right now. If you have time to study it, you see it appears that St. Peter's Basilica is falling to ruin all around him. You ask, how can this be a portrait of Paul VI? Where is Paul VI in this? A scene of destruction where the towers and the pillars of St. Peter's are, are collapsing in on each other and everything looks as though it's, it's in the process of, of being of disintegrating, the church in the process of disintegrating. But then you see in the lower center of, the, of this very amazing portrait, which is, oh my goodness, it, it must be close to 10 feet tall, you see a, a small, relatively small head, it's probably life-size, of Paul VI, uh, looking demonic. He's actually apparently hunched over, and through these squinting but piercing eyes, he has a look of, of diabolical fury and hatred, and underneath his chin, he's holding a dagger. The dagger is pointing downward, as you might see in a satanic ceremony, and it is dripping with blood. This is a, this is a portrait of Paul VI, a, 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 portrait that, and a portrait that Paul VI himself approved. In fact, Paul VI is quoted as commenting on that portrait that it is an accurate representation of the situation of the church at our time. That is Paul VI's assessment of this so-called portrait of his pontificate, which represents the church just collapsing in on itself, basically imploding. There are so many Masonic symbols in this 
Uh, th there's a whole list of them that are provided by those who study this portrait. But it is really a very interesting statement that Paul VI made that this represents, this accurately represents the condition of the church at, at our time. Is it any wonder, therefore, to see Francis following in the line of Paul VI, following the map charted out by Paul VI as to where the church must go, and now coming up with this church of the synod, this synodal church envisioned by Paul VI, even as, he, as uh, Francis is implementing this vision and about to canonize Paul VI as a saint of the new order. People have to ask themselves uh, where, where all of this is going. Uh, there are many already who, who see clearly where it's going. St. Pius X saw clearly well over a hundred years ago where all this was going. And he condemned all of this already before it even had taken place. Uh, all that's necessary is someone to take St. Pius X seriously, read what he wrote, and decipher it and understand it and connect it to with the events that are actually taking place before our very eyes today, to realize that modernism is having its heyday in the devastation of the church. In fact, there's an account uh, of an exchange between St. Pius X and one of the cardinals. A cardinal who, after Antistite Nostro in 1910, where St. Pius X um, implemented the oath against modernism for anyone who would be raised to authority in the church, become a cleric in the church. Anyone who would hear confessions or preach or have any position of authority in the church had to make this oath against modernism before the open tabernacle. Anyone who would be ordained to the subdiaconate, the diaconate, the priesthood, had to pronounce his oath against modernism with his right hand on the Gospels before the tabernacle the presence of our Lord, and swear that he would not do what the modernists, would not do what St. Pius X condemned. It is encyclical against the modernists. And um, so the Cardinal congratulated St. Pius X on having turned back the modernists, having thwarted them in their designs. And allegedly, St. Pius X sadly shook his head and said to the Cardinal, what I have done has merely made the modernists withdraw somewhat. But in 50 years, in half a century, they will be back to lay waste the church. We are seeing that. Remember, from 1910 to 1960, 50 years, John the 23rd calling Vatican II, saying it was a divine inspiration. Just like Francis saying it was a divine message from God to have communist bishops in the church. Yes, they, they attribute it, but to what God are they attributing this? How many gods can there be? There's only one true God. They must be attributing this to some false god of theirs. But that's what the modernists have. They believe in a God of surprises. They believe in a God of experiences, whom mankind experiences by their religious sentiment. That is not the true God revealing himself. Not in the eyes of a Catholic, anyway. Not in the mind of the Catholic Church. We need to really take stock of where this is all heading. It's heading where St. Pius X said exactly where it would, where it would head to the area of of atheism and pantheism combined. Atheism in the denial of the true God, pantheism of man ex exalting himself as Satan did to the very throne of God, mankind becoming God for itself. That's where it's going right now, in a one world religion under the control of an antichrist. So, dear people, we have to understand what's going on here. We read the encyclical against modernism, and we see all the elements spoken of as condemned by St. Pius X, which are now the very creed of the modernists. It is on the basis of these very principles St. Pius X condemned 
that the modernists are proceeding in building their church, not Christ's church, their church, which will be the, become the, the, the church of the, of the Antichrist. Um, anyway, we'll con continue our treatment of modernism in order to draw the parallels between the modernist creed and what we're witnessing happening today, as point by point by point, practically line by line in the encyclical of Pius X, we see him spelling out for us, forecasting for us well over a hundred years ago, exactly what we're seeing taking place now. And a word to the wise would be adequate right now to realize we cannot follow these modernists and what they're doing. We have to return to the practice of the traditional, the traditional practice of the traditional Catholic faith its mass, its sacraments, and the very concept of the church itself is at stake here. So with that, I bid you farewell now and hope to see you later. God bless you. Please pray for me. I will be praying for you.